I think we should be good to go. Yeah. Yeah, so hey everyone. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Kress's workshop on fentanyl intoxication or system failure, um, the current treatment system as intervention and effects. Uh, Dr. Kress, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, welcome. Um, my name is Marty Kraus. I'm the UBC Providence Leadership Chair for Addiction Research. I'm a psychiatrist at the University of British Columbia. And um, so the work on overdose and uh, its solutions is a big part of, uh, of our research. I'm working to a large degree on, on, um, in, on research projects. And um, as I said in my um, introduction, really uh, would appreciate um, a good exchange and uh, the collective um, um, collective endeavor to uh, end and address a historically threatening situation. And not only in British Columbia, I think that it will be the new normal also for a lot of other countries. So. Yeah, uh, Gubert, are there uh, already questions or shall I? No, there are no questions yet. Um, I think okay. you can proceed. Does anyone have any questions they want to speak out? If you do, you can just unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, I think we're good to go. Okay. Um, then I will, uh, is it visible? Yeah, it's in presenter view though. Yeah, is it, it's okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, um, okay. Uh, I was, uh, I, I will try to explain uh, some of the aspects I had to do fast in, in, in my presentation. So uh, obviously uh, the situation in uh, North America, especially uh, changed very dramatically over the last years, especially since step-by-step um, step since 2013. So what I want to emphasize is that there is not just a change in the individual patterns of use of, uh, of um, opiate users, it's, um, systematic change in uh, how drug markets are functioning in North America and also in some other countries. The two countries which I mentioned from Europe, Latvia and Lithuania um, also have similar uh, changes and, and developments. So the what I call here the traditional drug market means um, uh, street drug use, uh, dominated by by heroin and by the traditional um, combination with stimulants, for instance, in speed balls and benzodiazepines. Um, the, the development since 2013 is showing uh, contamination of street drugs, street opiates especially, with imported fentanyl from Asia, from India and China. And that um, was um, happening uh, until 2019. In this phase, um, users in most cases didn't know what they are getting. And the, per the, the percentage, as we know, of fentanyl as part of street drugs increased quite a bit. Since 2019, we see more and more fentanyl as a drug of choice. So users are um, demanding um, um, fentanyl as, uh, as drug, which is a very different situation. That means um, they have a high level of opiate tolerance, and that means also that most available old treatments and, and, and old drugs like buprenorphine and methadone are not working for, for that population. In addition, since 
2020, especially we see an increase in stimulant use. That is the situation in Canada and the situation uh, in the US. We have uh, also since 2019, uh, a local production of uh, fentanyl. So uh, um, uh, China stopped the importation of fentanyl. And since then only the legally available precursors are imported and um, the fentanyl itself is produced in laboratories in illegal laboratories in uh, along the west coast and in, in mexico especially so that's important to understand because that's the situation we need to respond to from a treatment and from a clinical perspective okay um uh, so are there any questions related to the um, drug markets um there's a there's a question in Huva and it's asking is there a comparison such contrast to be made between our treatment system and the more intensive long-term uh live-in treatments found in some countries i think portugal has this yeah um so uh, it's the, the comparisons are um, interesting, but also complicated because the drug markets have a, uh, a regional or an, a national component too. The availability of and um, and the role of fentanyl in European countries is different. You 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 don't see a comparable even contamination of street drugs with fentanyl uh, in a lot of European countries. You still have the traditional drug market pattern. You have street heroin, which is coming from Afghanistan, imported there. And um, you have kind of a drug market economy, which is different uh, to, uh, to the economy in North America. Portugal doesn't have and a reported fentanyl uh, problem so far. Switzerland doesn't have a reported fentanyl problem. They have more kind of the traditional uh, drug market environment. Um, but there are two countries in the Baltic Sea um, with a, a big Russian uh, minority, Lithuania and Latvia, where, where fentanyl is a big issue where they in, imported something called Chinese white and um, and and they have uh, the as, as you probably remember uh, uh, significant increases in in uh, their um, overdose uh, fatalities in, in these countries but overall the European countries don't see this significant fentanyl issue. Um, well, second point I want to make, fentanyl use in Europe is different. Uh, if it's happened, it's more a local um, phenomenon where users are seeking fentanyl and cooking up fentanyl patches. They're not injecting fentanyl with the original fentanyl uh, they bought on the street. They're producing it, um, repurposing a pain uh, fentanyl patches and and injecting at that and that led also to some uh, fatalities uh, for instance in Germany but this is a relatively small number to com compare to to Canada for instance okay and, and a follow-up question was is there a correlation between this intensifying toxicity and the widening economic disparity um, has the increase of suffering due to a smaller basket basket of goods available to those in income assistance or PWD, contributing to a demand for these capable periods. Um, so, yeah. um, difficult to say, um, but that would mean if you comparing countries, that you would have to um, uh, say compare it to their social and economic situation. So it's not. So for instance, um, yeah, 
in the U.S. and in the in in in, in Canada. Yes, um, it is. The, the these are rich countries, and there is a correlation to fentanyl use and uh, fentanyl availability uh, comparable to methamphetamine and and the current drug uh, crisis. If you um, go to, for instance, African countries or um, let's say low income countries in general, uh, so in South America, you absolutely you see um, very specific trends in, in, in use and you see uh, that cheap drug supply is far more relevant and is contributing to higher rates of, of fatalities. But the main trend in so the, uh, understanding the fentanyl dynamic, uh, if you have a potency of 50 times of uh, the potency of, 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 of morphine, so you, you only need to bring uh, a much smaller proportion or you need to produce a smaller proportion of these drugs. Uh, and um, uh, that is far more cost effective and far safer for, from a trafficking perspective. So I think that's the main driver. It's not just the um, social, uh, social aspects and the poverty marginalization in society. And the last question was, can you speak to the increase in benzodiazepines within the opioid supply in North America, uh, aside from implications this has for opioid overdose response? Uh, what, other, what other implications might, ha might this have in terms of drug supply toxicity? It's an important one because uh, it's kind of neglected. Um, yes. So um, I think it's important to look at benzodiazepines and also alcohol kind of from a broader perspective. In, for instance, the major reason for overdose fatalities, for instance, in Scotland are benzodiazepines, easily available and broadly accessible uh, street benzodiazepines. Um, uh, so it is, and also people who are a little older uh, and remember the open drug scenes in Europe in the 90s, they know that the reasons for overdose that time were uh, the combination of street heroin and benzodiazepines. That um, nowadays uh, it is seen here and there, but it's not a major trend in North America and in Canada. What is important also to remember if you are an opiate user, you experience withdrawal uh, a lot. And the way to deal with withdrawal, if you don't have um, ongoing supply of street drugs, is to use benzodiazepines or use alcohol or use more stimulants. So it's also a way for them to um, uh, deal with, with, for users to deal with withdrawal symptoms. So, um, which leads me to the critical role of substitution treatment. If you are able to address withdrawal symptoms with, um, for instance, with methadone even, or, or other substitution drugs, then you are able to stabilize the situation and also increase opiate tolerance for, for occasional fentanyl users. So that, I think the key thing to do is to qualify and establish easy accessible old treatment, uh, which is including a range of substances, uh, including uh, heroin, including hydromorphone, and probably in the future fentanyl, in order to, um, to stabilize the situation and prevent people from dying suddenly from a, from a fentanyl injection. Yeah. Um... The next question asks a similar thing. So um, I think yeah, we're good to move on. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to bring up this um, uh, picture again, because I think it's so interesting. Um, so the, uh, what, what, it, what it shows more or less that the um, rate of fatalities in general is directly related to the coverage of substitution treatment 
and to the, as you see on the left, on the y-axis, uh, the um, harm reduction measures. If you are providing safe injection sites and so on, uh, things are mm, uh, getting better, but especially if you have a higher coverage of uh, old treatment, you are able to address the overdose situation far more effectively. And Norway and Finland are playing a slightly different role, which is kind of, um, so they have a medium level of, um, uh, of fatalities, but um, uh, they, they're doing slightly more in, uh, in terms of uh, old treatment and, uh, and harm reduction measures. So, uh, for instance, the U.S. in the, I think last number I read was under the, the coverage of um, substitution treatment or treatment in the U.S. is under 20 percent. In Switzerland, it's around 70 percent. In France, it's around 70 percent. So it's um, it's a different ball game. And even if there are um, specific problems, you you are able to address it, especially to a high quality old treatment, which is um, um, able and to retain patients, which means you need to integrate the mental health component and the counseling component, and you need to offer them a substitution drug, which they really want and not what you think is the best uh, for them. You can and need to discuss that with your patients, but if they are not satisfied with what you're offering, they just stay away from treatment, and that's the most dangerous thing. Okay, yeah, and that leads then to these, these clusters, which are changing. There are also South American countries in the high cluster uh, coming up. So we will see internationally, we we'll see, um, unfortunately, a, a, a significant trend towards um, more overdose-related fatalities in the in the near future. Okay, are there uh, questions related to that? Um, there are a few questions from previous slides. Um, one was, uh, what would be the alternative substitute drug, say, prescription for this population to reduce the use of contaminated street drugs laced with fentanyl, considering they have different tolerances for methadone? Um, so that is um, gen it's, it's an important question related to what kind of treatment paradigms are we supporting and are we um, uh, addressing? Um, so the um, uh, I think um, the important thing is for uh, for a high quality substitution treatment, you need to provide a range of treatment options. There's not one uh, fits all. Um, so in the beginning it was methadone, and then here in Canada as a very unique situation, uh, you're using buprenorphine as a, a first line of response. Um, in Switzerland, for instance, uh, it's less than I think ten or about ten percent of the substitution treatments is provided through buprenorphine, uh, same amount as heroin assisted treatment, and there are rising numbers. Uh, of since it was regulated for slow release morphine, so KDN. So the uh, in in Austria, then for instance, the dominant substitution drug is KDN, the slow release morphine uh, too. This nearly two thirds of patients are treated with that, and then uh, the next big cluster would be methadone. So that's um, uh, very interesting. I think the most important thing is you need to address the needs of your patients. You need to listen to them and you need to kind of convince them uh, to stay, which is in the current situation, the changing situation, very complicated because fentanyl injection has a very powerful effect and it is cheap, it is available it's more used, which means uh, our patients have a significantly higher opiate tolerance uh, with very heavy withdrawal symptoms if you are in lack of supply. 
and no available uh, uh, substitution treatments. There are no uh, real uh, established um, uh, programs, and th that's where we start to work on um, what is necessary to provide, for instance, if a patient with fentanyl as a drug of choice coming into the hospital because of physical health problems and you think they need immediate treatment, how do you settle them? How do you, what are you offering them? And um, that is kind of the most important question right now. And it's also a critical question what to do afterwards. What is the kind of treatment we need to offer in order to retain these patients in, in treatment? And this is kind of an open question. It's similar to the situation in the 90s when we started the heroin assisted treatment uh, trial in uh, Europe, in several European countries, uh, which led then to the regulation in, I think, eight or nine European countries uh, with, with good success in terms of stopping the overdose and the HIV development in these countries. So um, I guess another question is, do you foresee an increase in the availability of IOAT? Um, that's a question to ask the minister, more or less. I would highly recommend that. The capacity for heroin assisted treatment and for hydromorphone assisted treatment is, 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 is very small. And an um, important point to mention right away, so yeah, you heard I'm a psychiatrist, and we have a significant discussion uh, who should uh, run the, uh, the, the response. And so I think it needs to be run by uh, a range of uh, professionals and, 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 and clinics. But what I'm 100% cons convinced of is counseling and um, and uh, good mental health care are critical components of um, the overdose response. Because the patients we are seeing are not living normal lives. They don't have a um, history of stable childhood and adolescence. So uh, they need more than just a drug. They, they need um, uh, good and appropriate care among the patients in several big representative studies from all parts of the world, we saw about two-thirds of intravenous drug users reporting early childhood trauma in, 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 in their life. So you can predict, so the risk of, uh, the risk of becoming an intravenous drug user and, and, and um, choosing that path is uh, significantly higher um, if you have a history of trauma and if you have a high burden of, of mood disorder, anxiety, or other things. So we, you need to address both. Otherwise, there is no way out. And the risk of suicide or the risk of overdose, which is always uh, also very often a concurrent event, um, is, is getting high. Um, so another question was, can't the federal government regulate the supply of drugs and what factors would contribute to increase in consumption of drugs? Um, the, the, absolutely, the, the federal government can regulate nearly everything. So, but I think this, the point to start is to regulate treatment which are effectively used in other countries. So, um, for instance, um, there are a um, significant amount of substances which are proven to be effective as part of old treatment and could, which could improve the range of, of treatment options, which is critical in our situation. So, um, so th I think that is one important thing. Um, my opinion on safe supply is um, the safest supply is if you provide also high potent opiates, especially high potent opiates in a safe therapeutic environment, not just distribute them. So if you provide them, make, make, make them easy, success, accessible as you can study in the Crosstown Clinic in downtown Vancouver. 
the numbers, uh, the risk of overdose is controllable. And it's not zero, but it is far easier. And the better the psychosocial components, the housing components, and everything is, the uh, the more we have, will be able to contain uh, and and reduce the the fatality numbers. Okay, and last question is how long should that treatment be done to achieve a resolved ACEs impacted development? And I think this is referring to something before. Um, yes, there, there, there was um, always the, uh, the discussion uh, about length of treatment. I think um, interestingly, so if um, I use my experience with heroin assisted treatment, uh, there is not, that is not an open-ended intervention. Most people, uh, most users are um, staying in heroin assisted treatment, especially also in injectable O treatment, not longer than three, four years. But if they need it, they should get it. So because there, we don't have a lot of alternative, it's, I think, um, a critical component of every successful treatment is user's choice. It's also true for pain. You need to not do everything people are asking you to do, but uh, you need to um, work with your client to find the most, the safest and the most appropriate and helpful treatment addressing the mental health, the emotional and the physical uh, treatment needs of, of intravenous drug use. That's the safest way. And it's also the most cost-effective way. If you remember the discussion we had around HIV, to have somebody, only one person infected with HIV is far more, uh, let's say, expensive in all um, meanings of that word um, than just treating them effectively and appropriately. So that is saving lives and saving money. Okay. Um, do you want to move on to other slides? Um, there's another question if you want to ask, uh, if you want to answer. Yeah, push the question and then I, I go on afterwards. Okay. Um, do you have an opinion on the guided use of MDMA, ketamine, or psilocybin for treating trauma, PTSD? Uh, which is a common factor of many opioid users. Yes, um, that's a, okay. That's a, a huge trend. So let me answer um, in a more general way. I think um, old drugs or psychopharmacos treatments and whatever are a necessary tool, but they are only uh, one component, and they, they are not the solution. Um, what you're doing if you're using uh, NDMA or uh, others, um, you are kind of undermining the emotional or psychological defense and trying to uh, bring people to reflect their situation, experience other emotions and, 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 and stuff. I, uh, think, I think the easier uh, way from my perspective would be to provide good psychotherapy, to provide a safe environment to provide um, really um, uh, good counseling. And as a normal, as a routine, not something to ask for. Trauma therapy should be part of every drug treatment, full stop. So um, it, it works if it makes things easier and better for some. Yeah, let's try it, let's, uh, let's figure it out. My clinical experience is that if you offer something uh, on a psychological, psychotherapeutic uh, level, you already achieve a lot. Um, um, a, a person's asking, um, um, there's a question that was an answer. What factors would contribute to future increase in consumption of drugs? I think you answered that, didn't you? Yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah, I think we're good to move on. Okay, so it, um, so I, I already talked about that. So we have uh, obviously very, very significant differences between countries. And you have some countries which are um, have extremely 
concerning increasing uh, numbers. Also, the international reporting is not that well. It's not that good. Um, well, I think the European numbers, some to a certain degree, showed that. Um, so we need uh, to learn uh, uh, more. Also, what's going on, for instance, in South America? What's going on in some smaller states in Europe and the Scandinavian countries? So, um, but we definitely see these three clusters. Um, so if you have time, that, that's a very nice a compilation of the current situation. And if you're interested, you can contact us. We're happy to share some of our publications and also some of the work in progress we're doing. So I want just to touch base on uh, one other component related to overdose because in primary care and so in other parts of medicine, we see a lot of chronic pain patients. Uh, um, who get uh, opiates for pain treatment, uh, especially over the also the, the last 10 years, to a significant and, and part mind-boggling uh, degree. And that is true also for countries with no overdose crisis. So we, in Switzerland, in Canada, in Germany, in the United States, you see high levels of prescription, opiate prescription for pain. Pain is a very complex issue. And if you have very little time and very few specialists, it's, it's, it's complicated to manage. Uh, the interesting thing in this graph is that you see also countries, uh, as I mentioned in a positive way, the Netherlands with an increase and very significant amount of uh, prescription opiate use and um, not an overdose crisis at all, which is leading me to our hypothesis that it's not only about the prescription of opiates and, 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 and drugs, it's especially also about the healthcare framework, uh, which is existing, the way opiates are prescribed and only prescribed in a very well monitored way and not for years and not for a long time and other treatments are kind of also available. Uh, so it's not just the drug, it is also this, what we call opiate stewardship. And um, so uh, nevertheless, uh, it is absolutely important to become more sensitive in the overall medical community, how to provide alternatives to prescription opiates um, and um, um, be a little bit more critical in um, handing out prescription for months of uh, a pain treatment without seeing the patient, without really considering other options and, 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 and then increasing the risk of um, uh, overdose and of uh, high, high potent uh, opiate use. Um, give you one example. We just did a study together with our colleagues in anesthesia. And we found that, for instance, healthy patients um, after a cesarean section were to a large degree prescribed opiates. We were really astonished. If you compare standard procedures surgery procedures in uh, European centers and in North American centers, the um, um, post-operative treatment in Europe is with opiates is 5% and the um, standard procedure in North America is roughly said over 80% uh, post-operative opiate treatment. So this is something we could easily change if we reorganize and reconsider parts of our our pain treatment. Yeah, that was a remark, I think, which is important because it's not just prescription use, it's the whole stewardship of medication and the integration of, uh, um, of good psychosocial care, good uh, medical care, and uh, the use of, of any pharmacotherapies.
yeah, that's it to that topic. Any any comments or question, uh, Gopra? Um, yeah, so there was a comment made. Um, this might be uh, in relation to something uh, before, but the comment is we need a day treatment uh, for people in Cadian. Hydromorph safe supply I need benzo taper as their supply has tizolam. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, presently, most treatment centers are residential and require detox from fentanyl first. Uh, these day treatment centers would require trauma counselors, which are rare and far between for us providers presently. Um, so the question was, what do you think of that? I think it is a, a great idea. We need, as, so, um, we need a range of treatment options and we need a range of, uh, of treatment settings. So uh, the, the goal is not to have um, as much bed as possible. The, the goal is to um, support and treat patients where they are. And that very often means um, you have to do it virtually, you have to do it in a day clinic, you have to do it in outpatient services or even in outreach services. So um, that is so, so important to be more flexible in order to adapt to different needs. So we have a range of needs and we have a range of options and we are really not using these options um, as quickly and as effective as possible. So there's also something to learn from other countries. And I think especially outreach treatment, for instance, in collaboration with housing providers uh, would be a wonderful um, a synergy. And the same thing with for forensics. So the same thing with, uh, with youth programs. So we need to bring the expertise where it's needed and not just stick to the treatment settings, which are, we are used to. So beds and, and acute care is only a short-term option um, with limited benefits. So we need long-term options. And that means in the treatment in the community and in, uh, in day clinics and people can continue work and, and, and they get support in real life conditions. Yep, that was it for questions. Um, again, uh, if anyone wants to ask anything, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, people are shy. Um, um, okay. Um, yeah. I'm, I've unmuted myself. Um, Tony here. That's a fantastic slide, um, the one showing the usage per million across the different countries, the last slide you had on. Yeah. I think this slide says it all because there's really quite a substantial use of opioids in many of the European countries to the right of the listed countries, over 15,000 per million. And yet there's only one or two countries where we have the opioid crisis. So to say that um, these European countries have, have solved the uh, opioid issue is maybe a bit of a misnomer. They're still allowing people, if that's their choice, to consume the drug. But then obviously they're providing the services that um, when people get into difficulty, it doesn't go into crisis. Yes. So um, I, I really like this slide. It's very informative, especially when you see the tick up at the end, of course, with the United States statistics. Uh, anyway, so thank you for including this slide. Yeah, and it's, um, I, I think it's, it's so important because it's kind of, um, uh, reflecting um, uh, in part not very sophisticated use of opiates. It's not just about opiate or non-opiate. It's about, um, so what I would say medication stewardship. Uh, it's important to, to provide also alternatives, make people aware that they can make uh, informed choices and, um, and good access, for instance, to pain care, which is quite complicated. If you have to wait for seeing a pain specialist or a pain clinic again for half a year or a year, that's ridiculous. Yeah. So, um, and leads to then to self-made solutions at the corner of Maine and Hastings in downtown Vancouver uh, and, and uh, deterioration of, of, of that situation. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, and uh, another question is, can you speak to the government response to funding for program development and needs? 
It has typically been underfunded. Do you witness shifts in attitudes regarding this? There are, there is uh, um, a, a first willingness to create um, more opportunities. On the other hand, uh, so the interesting question, and that was also the case in the related to the HIV uh, pandemic and related uh, to um, similar situations, um, is how do you measure the necessary response and, and the necessary um, allocation of resources? Is that okay, a, a budget consideration or is it to address a crisis? So uh, if we would spend, um, for instance, in response to the COVID crisis or the HIV pandemic, our budget according to what we think is fiscally responsible, we would still have skyrocketing mortality in HIV. We wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, be able to now have a little bit of relief related to COVID-19. Uh, and the overdose situation is totally different. So um, um, for whatever reasons, the willingness to invest and to allocate resources um, uh, compared to the level needed, uh, the uh, funding of substance use services and mental health services is uh, very extremely low and insufficiently low. You will not be able to create a treatment system as necessary um with with these resources and also with a with a level of expertise we have right now um there needs to be a paradigm shift how to address it as it happened uh, related to the hiv uh, pandemic and that is also not so far long so far uh, gone and uh, it's not resolved uh, anyhow but we're spending several $10,000 per patient per year uh, to keep the incidence uh, of HIV low. We, we most likely need to do that for the overdose crisis too. Yep, that's it in terms of questions. Okay, um, so, um, um, so yeah, I, I think this, um, uh, the, the numbers here uh, point in a direction. So given the, also if you um, start calculating the, the fatalities for this year, we will probably end up over 2000 this year in British Columbia. And yeah, the fentanyl level is and stays high, which is leading to the discussion we need to start. Uh, do we need to have, um, um, do we need to have a fentanyl substitution treatment program, or do how do we how, how do we face that situation? At least we need more capacity in heroin assisted treatment, hydromorphone assisted treatment, and we need to think about how to attract more uh, patients in a way that, uh, that it really has an effect on on, on overdose fatality. So, um, and again. That is related to what I mentioned. We now have significant big laboratories in, in, in British Columbia and in other parts of Canada producing fentanyl. We have homemade fentanyl, high purity, big, uh, big numbers. So I think they produce five kilograms a week right now and, the, and they can certainly do more. So the that is a different situation than uh, needing to import it from outside the country. So, and uh, creating a different environment. I don't um, uh, want to repeat my staff too much, but the point is we need to start to discuss among the professionals and also the users what to do to reduce the risk, to be aware of the risk, to be also uh, able to discuss our failures because we were not able to reduce the numbers significantly and to say, okay, uh, we, if we have, so it's a very relative perspective. We say, okay, we have 
1,500 instead of 2,000 fatalities, is that a success? A very limited access, uh, success, I would say. So we need to be honest to ourselves and say, oh, a success is if we are bringing down the numbers to uh, a really the same level of whatever, uh, Switzerland or, or Germany or Austria or other countries. And if we are able to prevent the overdose catastrophe happening also in more countries worldwide. Okay, I stop my slides here and um, wonder um, whether we have um, more um, comments and, and, and questions face on. Everybody is hiding behind the screens, uh, beside Sakina and uh, and some uh, some nice pictures here from uh, the photo app. But um, so it's an opportunity to uh, to discuss. How much do we? How much time do we have still, Guprit? Um We have about uh, fourteen minutes. Fourteen minutes. So. That's I can I can provide you with endless numbers of slides, but I think that's kind of boring. This is should be about uh, interaction. So, um, what are your what are you thinking in terms of the relatively grim picture I I I I try to address? Hi, this is Haley. I have unmuted. Um, I'm uh, Haley Broker, family doctor, North Shore, working in Foundry and Stepping Stones to work with both adults and youth. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of our youth are engaged because we give them the hydromorph, um, to tell you the truth, um, and they stay engaged and, and um, knock wood, stay alive, um, you know, along with Oat, like Katie and, and um, and methadone and suboxone. Um, and it sounds funny giving people hydromorph who are on suboxone, but that's, it, it keeps them engaged and stops, if it stops them from using fentanyl, it's like, we, we do anything to do that. So now the question is, um, with the fentanyl patch and also with the um, buckle, I forget what it's called now, <laughs> it's got a name, but the buckle fentanyl um, in the mouth, um, it's, you know, because of the sort of rules around, um, you know, changing the patch um, and supplying the buckle, which um, I don't even know if they're doing in Vancouver, they're still waiting for a protocol. Um, it's hard for us out in the communities and in foundries to offer this, which I think uh, might be good, but we just don't have the staffing, you know, to um, do the changes, especially on weekends. So I'm just, um, what we need is, I guess I'm asking, how do we get protocols? Um, this sounds like a legal form of fentanyl that we could provide for our patients. Um, it doesn't, it won't give them the high, they'll still want something else, but um, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ailey. Um, so, um, so I, there is a general component, a very specific component to the, the fentanyl application. The general component is I'm really advocating for uh, working on clinical solutions which are uh, including uh, so in, in engaging our patients effectively. So you're working with young people, so you know how, uh, how the, also the, the major trends are in that area. So uh, still a lot of pediatricians and others are scared of the situation and, uh, and are um, yeah, demanding abstinence and, and, and whatever, and you, you lose the patients immediately. So this is why you see they don't want to go also, even after an overdose, very often they don't want to go into the, to the hospital because they know that there is not the care they're expecting and they, they, they're looking for. So um, um, uh, second thing is, uh, yeah, we need to provide pharmacological solutions which are safe and we need a clear rationale for that. Just distributing and to keep them slightly above the water 
is probably not a sufficient treatment paradigm. So you, you, you need, if you work in primary care or if you work as pediatrician or whatever, you need the immediate and integrated support of, of counselors. Somebody needs to work with the family too. Uh, and and, you, and and engagement has different components. You need to involve the peers. And so we know from, from um, the history, um, successful programs also to retain people, you need somebody who is making contacts or intensive case manager. If you have, so we have so much kids, especially we know that from US numbers, um, um, overdosing and not seeing anybody. So they just go home. And, and nobody's looking after them. Nobody is trying to engage them and, and provide them good care. Okay, so that is, there is a system component absolutely missing. And that's probably what's true for kids is also true for a lot of the adults. Um, the, the fentanyl application, I, you, uh, I think you're right. We need to develop safe protocols uh, in order to um, provide high potent opiate but that needs to be closely monitored. It needs to be safe. You need to also develop a effective response. For instance, um, some of um, um, our colleagues in, in Vancouver General Hospital, you can, the Puya Azar, for instance, you can see in his workshop uh, later today, um, they are uh, together with us working on these solutions. And uh, we need to accept there is a new challenge and we need to address it in an appropriate and, and say, well, that means you need to evaluate that. You need to fund this evaluation. You need to be um, thorough in, in, in what you're doing. That was the same with heroin assisted treatment uh, in the 90s. So it's not a totally new thing. And I, I was actually surprised in the, because I was a PI in the Salome study that a successful trial was never really implemented in Canada. So uh, to, or it, it was all more or less left on a, a relatively low level. So we have um, very limited capacity in, in that regard. Yeah, we need these clinics and especially we need something for, for successful kids because in that age, the risk of uh, dying of an overdose is especially high with the exploratory use of substances. It's, very, it's a very, very vulnerable period in their lives anyhow. And if we're not responding to that, we lose a lot, of, a lot more adolescents and, and young adults uh, um, uh, in, in, the, in the very near future. Thank you for bringing that up, Heidi. Uh, I'll, I'll chime in on from the from the counseling side of things um the last year and a bit i've been doing day treatment um and and running a case load on the side uh the the that challenge that you were talking about in terms of uh the 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 wraparound um care right like it's not it, it there's so many people that's actually needed right like so I would I would start covering maybe the counseling thing, but it's always broken, right? Like you'll be chasing them, and they so the 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 so then you need an outreach person, and that's a new referral, right? And and then they're struggling with their finances and their social lives and their family and their housing. Like they've got this whole basket of of issues that, uh, and while they're, I haven't seen a lot of like. And I might be wrong here, but on oat, upticking in those skills, right? Like those those activities of daily life don't really get taken care of by oat. Like they stay alive, but they they're not getting into that um, that level of care. So, um, I that was actually one of my questions that I had started writing, and I that it kind of got answered, and I was like, oh, I'll just leave it. Um, but. So when we're exploring the scope of care that we would want to put in place, right? So like, okay, so if we're not gonna, um, if we're not quite getting it yet, how how much do we need? Um, yeah, 
But this is, um, uh, Stuart, that has two components also. That is, one is the disintegration of the treatment system. So everybody is working in this little silo or, and, and uh, it is not integrate. And the tough part is, is, is uh, for, the, for the client to integrate all of that. And very often they are speaking to one person, oh, telling them uh, uh, this and, and another person something totally different. And they have to make sense of it, which is difficult for adolescents. But it's uh, even more, um, uh, and it's it's difficult for every, more or less for everybody. So um, if we are, uh, are not able to arrange integration on a system level, let's say communicating between the primary care doc, the the, the counselor, or even being in one in one service together, uh, uh, how we can we expect for our patients? to handle the treatment system. The treatment system should provide care and a framework, but it's very often looking the other way around. They need to maneuver and navigate a very complicated system and the parents too, the professionals too. And, and that yeah. is burning a lot of resources, which I find, uh, uh, say, astounding the least. Uh, more, more and more in my imagination, I wish, I wish we could do like a dementia village style where they would live and you know everything's kind of in a circle so you can't get lost and the people who are who are doing some of the other functions of the of the town are also trained right so like the cashier not only does your checking out but they're like hey did you did you see the opportunity to like some recreation or <laughs> and they're guiding people um even in those those little interactions but that again would be like a, a pretty big project to to try to. But we could start with something, and I would like to emphasize that at the, at the end of our discussion, but also as one major purpose why we are doing that. Um, instead of looking at the silos and looking at how to protect our turf and wh whatever, I think we need to really collectively start thinking: okay, how can we? accomplish change how can we what do we need to do what needs to be the part uh, of every single partner in that uh, st uh, struggle really to have kind of a common sense of of synergy instead of uh I say oh yeah i'm a primary care physician i know anyhow from my practice what to do or i'm a psychiatrist that's not my 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 uh, my task or to deal with that and they should come sober and see me for prescribing him nice pharmacotherapies you know that's kind of it's not working that way so we need to get our act together as as professionals and as system decision makers and and then provide the best possible framework for our patients And I, I hope we are really making a little bit of progress. We at least like to raise the question. I actually really love that village idea. I'm just picturing a small Olympic village where there is the residents with small kitchens and stuff. And then you have a grocery store and you have, you know, and you have an IOT site um, so that they can inject when they need to. And you have the counselor building and, you know, things like this, where um, you would have a tiny little village where they would actually buy groceries and cook their own meals and get help with that if they need to have housing. Um, yeah, I, that just sounds wonderful. And I, I've actually been writing a short story on this. I just have to finish it. But like as a thought experiment, because you would have a, a hospital in there, not just not just I, but so many healthcare like problems these folks are having. And to be able to like have it all walkable <laughs> would be nice. Right. And so then you're not having sirens and stuff so much. Uh, anyway. I, yeah. And then you have and then you have the arts and and volunteer activities and jobs like folks once they get to a certain level of functioning then they they join the community right like they're um doing stuff but it's but it's all kind of controlled so there's not so many cues right you don't go play baseball and someone says oh hey i've, I've got something in my pack right like <laughs> or what are we going to do after the game we're going to go to the bar right like there's no bar so we're going to go you know watch Netflix or, or play board games or something. It's going to be different. Um, 
but we could Options do a lot. Of, Stuart, we, we 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 could do a lot of things already with the existing housing programs. There are some really good housing programs we could start with, and if we would integrate and the ho housing piece with the counseling piece with a uh, with a uh, substitute treatment, why does a uh, let's say a addiction doc or addiction psychiatrist need to sit in his clinic? Why is he not? in the housing program because or where the most of the clients are and and provide this environment you just uh, sketch i think that should be should be uh, the next steps and that that would be really uh, a huge uh, a huge progress we we could easily make i think yeah, there's some there's there's some like our housing things has some some little little things that we do need to pay a little bit more attention to um one of my one of my friends like posts on facebook oh congratulations to the architect of, of this new uh housing thing and i commented underneath like make sure those units are soundproof because a lot of our folks have trauma that makes them kind of uh hyperacusis right like they're sensitive to sound mm -hmm. and and they're hearing things sometimes sirens sometimes assaults sometimes other like people yelling and stuff or pacing or, you know, doing whatever they're doing in the units next to them and they can't handle it because it's the middle of the night or whatever. And then they will literally choose their truck over the paid for housing because it's just not comfortable enough. So yeah, we, we do have to get past or like, we're going to give you this tiny little thing that's, that sort of looks like just enough, but then it turns out to not be enough. But anyway. But this is a starting point. I think th these kinds of vision mm -hmm. are needed. And this is, I think, the the, the 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 starting point is really start to listen to your uh, to your patients, and really to the to the to the families, and really try to accommodate there and address their needs. And 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 that would be actually that would require from us not to think in the the housing worker is doing the housing piece, the counselor is just talking about trauma, and the physician is just looking after medications. That is totally old fashioned, outdated uh, uh, thinking in the system of care. And this is something we need to change. Um, just to interrupt for a minute, um, the session has sort of ended, but you know, since we have a discussion going on, you know, we can stay behind. Um, for those who want to leave, you're, feel, you're more than welcome to leave and view the posters and videos. But um, it sounds like there's a lot of questions and, you know, and the discussion we're having. So feel free to continue. Why don't you then read some of the questions? It, yeah, sure. Um, so first question was, um, if, we're, if we were to start IO fentanyl, we also need sites to support injection fentanyl to help people on the program. Do you think the government and health authorities um, support this? If so, how far away do you think uh, we are from seeing this? Um, so there are some really uh, engaged uh, colleagues st starting to work on that, but um, in order to do something quick and effectively, you need resources. Uh, we have limited resources for that, but we are starting to work on, on, on protocols for instance, to address um, uh, users uh, uh, coming to uh, acute care physical problems in, in into the hospital, and but uh, as as Haley mentioned in the beginning, there need to be also a good um, uh, solid evaluation of other uh, routes of administration, because uh, related to fentanyl, you have more inhaling, you have uh, transdermal, you have very soon, I think, nasal application. That's only one part, but we need to figure out how that will fit into uh, the overdose prevention uh, paradigm and, uh, and, and that needs testing. And it's also the question, what do we need to do in order to engage uh, patients and, and, and really have them in uh, our programs long term? So. Uh, um, there is some work going on, but far too slow, and, and uh, the clinical research in, in BC has very little attention in that regard, and very little resources. 
I, which is surprising. It's the biggest problem, but um, um, kind of we. It's some people think it's uh, possible just to sit and wait. Okay. Um, and the next question was your comments about having wraparound supports as an expectation of routine care really resonates with me. What should be included in a business case to government to make make this happen? I guess you know what would you propose to make it happen? Um, yeah, there are uh, two comments on that. Uh, one is um, that they our uh, patients have a, a range of needs. They have a variety of needs which need to be addressed. If you do that bit by bit, you're very ineffective, and you are you very often lose uh, the uh, uh, the patients. Um, so. Um, counseling is not, uh, uh, for instance, is not an add-on. It needs to be an integrated part of treatments like that. So uh, the same thing is for good physical health care. If you have, for instance, you have a decreasing life expectancy, of, if you have a complex concurrent disorders, as most of our clients have, of 30 years to your lifespan, imagine what would happen in, in, in cancer care or, or other areas or infectious disease, how much money would be spent to address that? Not in, in, in our field. So the second main reason is you only effective if you um, think in an integrated way, not just pitch and patch. Uh, the um, other thing uh, is um, really um, retention. Um, Come on, the most ineffective use of capacity and intervention is if people leaving after a few days or a few a few, few weeks at, at the retention rate under 30% means that two thirds of the patients are leaving in the first year, which is means clearly they are not dis, they are dissatisfied. They are not happy with what, what they get it. So, um, if you are in, let's say, in a close interaction with your client through, a, for instance, a counselor, through a healthcare worker, through a peer or whatever, then you know, you know what's happening. You can predict who will leave and who will stay. And um, so, and, and um, leaving a, a treatment program is not a success. It's the opposite of success. It's a failure. So uh, we need to increase uh, the engagement. We need to increase them to stay and to work with us and to experience us as open advocates for them and offering them what they need. And uh, so there are two important reasons. You're only effective if you integrate services. And second, you're only able to engage patients if you offer them what they need and what they want. Very simple. I, 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 th I think there was a, a, there is a slow movement toward uh, regulating our treatment centers and, and recovery homes, right? I've kind of had a number of people kind of come through these, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say fly by night, but sort of like just somebody's house that they've now labeled a you know, recovery home and, and say they do the 12 steps. Um, and it doesn't usually provide anywhere close to what they're what their needs are. Um, I think as we, if we can move toward that regulation uh, and have like an overarching standard of care, that that might be a step toward reducing the folks who are just like, nope, I'm, you know, I've been shamed, right? And even our some of the practice practices that happen in in some treatment centers where there is an overuse of shame, um, still even to this day a little bit, uh, or or kind of processes that might bring in too much activation for people to tolerate. And then they're like, well, no, I'm not going to do this for another four weeks. Right. So um, finding that, that really gentle titrated way that's meeting needs and still, and still adding education and, and learning to their experiences. I agree. Anyway, yeah. I agree. I, um, I think, let me, um, let me, um, finish on a, 
on a very important note uh, from our perspective, I think the most important thing for us is really to listen to our clients and to offer them offer, offering them uh, what they need. That doesn't mean we, you always need to say yes, or you should always say yes uh, to what they want, but it means that you establish an attachment and a relationship which allows you to work with them on an ongoing basis. And also always question yourself, if somebody's leaving, why are they leaving? And, uh, and to, uh, to do our part in integrating services in a, in a good way, supporting our colleagues um, uh, too, because we have a common purpose there. Even if uh, we don't like what others are doing, we have a common purpose. We need to bring down the numbers. And uh, that's an ethical, that is a medical or um, academic or therapeutic need. Uh, and uh, if we're not doing that, we're failing. And I don't want us to fail. And I don't want especially to fail uh, uh, my clients and my patients. So I really thank you a lot. And uh, I, I like this discussion a lot. I hope you take something from it too and we need so as i said in the very beginning it's not the end it's the beginning and we are in uh, really in the desperate need of change and uh, i would love you to um to to join that uh, movement really uh, and not lame excuses status quo is not an option as another smart person said today um let's uh, let's try really to to rock the boat a little bit Thank you very much, and I hope to see you uh, at other occasions uh, during this event and otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys.